Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Palliative Care Chalk Talk. My name is Kristen. I will be your moderator today. I'm a hospice chaplain with LA Home and Hospice in the Brookfield area, and it is my great privilege today to introduce our presenters. Haroon Ferdosi is a Chicago suburbs native with an engineering background from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He was brought into the field of funeral service through the death of his mother in 2001. He's the president and CEO of Muslim Funeral Services, a company with six locations in the Chicagoland area. Dr. Sami is an internal medicine physician with the Advocate Medical Group in Chicago. Um, he's a former RN. He's been working with Advocate for 15 years and is currently in his first year of seminary. Today, they will be presenting on end of life care for the Muslim patient. So I'll turn it over to you too. Sounds great. Welcome everyone. Um, as Kristen mentioned, um, part of my, my role in the last couple of years has been the uh, amazing opportunity to work with the uh, chaplaincy residency uh, within Advocate. Um, so I've been able to sort of interact and deliver some content related to uh, end of life care and, and general care of the Muslim patient. I wanted to sort of begin uh, with a brief introduction before we dive into to details. Um, when you think of sort of demographics within the Chicagoland area and, and sort of nationally, Muslims have been around for a couple of hundred years, right? So uh, when you think of, you know, slavery and, and a, a lot of Muslims came across then initially, but really the, the large amount of Muslims that you see now sort of immigrated in, in the 60s. And so most of these Muslims were, came over as professionals, uh, really in, in the urban areas and sort of congregated there. So you can sort of see in, in a lot of the major urban areas and Chicago is, 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 a, is a definite example of that. So most of the Muslims you see have, have started coming from there. And then obviously there've been waves of, of immigration and then also uh, born and bred American Muslims um, within, within the United States. To, to sort of introduce the topic um, at the risk of turning this into uh, a, an introdu introduction to Islam, I, I wanted to give sort of just like a 30 second elevator speech of sort of what is, what is Islam. Um, the core belief is the belief in one God, right? And, and so that's a core belief that sort of emanates within all aspects of our religion. Everything sort of surrounds that. But along with that, there are sort of a list of different beliefs. And, and within, in addition to that belief, for example, the belief in prophets. So the belief that um, uh, that God sent down prophets, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon all of them, uh, down with, with revelation. Uh, belief in angels, right? That, that angels are around us, that they, they do the service of, of God. Uh, the belief in the divinely revealed books, right? So uh, all of the books that were sent by God and so forth. Uh, the belief in uh, predestination, right? That things uh, are, are destined. And, and part of that belief includes life after death. So as we sort of talk and, and introduce these concepts, remember that life after death is a very core concept within the belief structure of a Muslim, that it, the time of death, the place of death is predetermined, is predestined. It, you know, we, we, we say sometimes the only thing that's certain in life is death, right? And we've heard that many times, this sort of idiom, um, but, but that concept is fairly firmly placed within the, uh, the core of, of, of Muslim belief that this is predetermined, this, the, the, the time of death, but that death doesn't end there. In fact, it's sort of the beginning of the next phase of life. And, and part of that uh, involves um, uh, the process of how that, uh, how that uh, transfer occurs. Another core aspect is um, as parents, you know, a very critical responsibility is taking care of children, but even within, within the Quran and within tradition, um, taking care of parents is sort of a very um, uh, important aspect of, of our faith, of our religion. Um, and the status of parents um, is, is considered very high. In fact, uh, the love of parents is simply, is only second to, to, to God and, and the prophets. Um, so you can imagine that that status, that level is so high. Um, and so as you start to think of family involvement and so forth, um, keeping in mind that um, as a patient is getting closer to that, 
um, that opportunity to serve the elder, that opportunity to serve the patient becomes that, that much more important. Marty, do you mind going to the, um, to our, yep, right there. So I just wanted to kind of dive in really quickly to this concept of death and dying in Islam before we sort of go into that second phase of, of palliative care. So the perspective of sickness, when you think about that, sickness is something that is some, uh, to some degree is an expiation for sins. It's, it's, a, it's a means of forgiveness, uh, even being uh, uh, pricked by a thorn, for example, is a means of, uh, of forgiveness because you've, you've gone through that sort of uh, suffering. But this idea of, uh, of sickness is part of that concept of predestination and, and will uh, and so forth. Um, so, so that's sort of the introduction I wanted to, to give and, and I'll pass it off to, um, to Mufti Harun to sort of take over and, and start to talk about what happens as we start getting closer to death what, is the, what are the aspects of the family and the involvement of the family, uh, the focus on speed, uh, which, is, which is very different than you'll see in many other traditions, and then sort of what to expect as you see the family there, what to expect with, when medical examiner and other specific situations are brought in. Yeah, th thank you, Dr. Sami. Uh, yeah, I think that was a very nice uh, synopsis of an introduction. The reason why that was important is so we can understand why family members are there in the hospital. Um, the reason, actually, before I get into that, I wanted to thank the staff here uh, because I have a personal, uh, you know, how can you say, uh, experience with palliative care. My mother died at home. She died of pancreatic cancer. Uh, you know, she was diagnosed in April 2001. She passed away in August, just four months. Uh, and the staff was very helpful. Uh, they came in, the nurses were wonderful, and they accommodated our wishes. Um, so I think this presentations like this are important so that we can try to um, share our concerns with the rest of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the occupation. Um, so, so based on that, uh, the family aspect, as Dr. Sam was mentioning, you will see maybe as compared to some of the other cultures, I'm just trying to compare so, you know, use, so what you may be used to at, uh, you know, at nursing homes or maybe at hospice care centers, um, such as Seasons Hospice or even you know, at home at hospice. Um, so what may be different uh, is that you may see a lot of family involvement. Uh, just as Dr. Sami mentioned, we, we you know, we um, consider it an honor to take care of our parents. Just as they took care of us when we were young, they, you know, they changed our diapers, they fed us, and uh, it's part of our responsibility that now as they get older, we look after them um, and, you know, send them on their way to their final destination. So the reason I bring that up is because you may see a lot of family members being involved. And in fact, uh, sometimes, uh, you may see secondary and tertiary level family members making decisions which you may think that, uh, you know, immediate family members, the legal next of kin may be involved in. For example, uh, you, you know, uh, so making arrangements for the cemetery, you know, having the nurses take care of the paperwork, stuff like that. Whereas the immediate family members may be inside the hospital room or maybe inside, uh, you know, in the bedroom, you know, with the with, with the, the, the patient and during the last minutes, but the other secondary you know, family members, some cousins or, or other siblings, they may be making funeral arrangements, they may be talking to the nurse, they may be talking to uh, you know, the police if it's involved sometimes if it's a you know, sudden death, et cetera. So I'm just bringing that out there that you should not be surprised if you have multiple family members involved as compared to uh, you know, just immediate uh, you know, uh, spouse and immediate children. So the extended family does help involve. Um, so keeping that in mind, so when the actual event does occur, meaning when someone does pass away, uh, another thing to keep in mind is that there may be certain rituals um, that the families may wish to proceed with. Uh, rituals in the sense that uh, even though, uh, you know, as Dr. Sami mentioned, there's, you know, Muslims have been here for a while, Right now, this estimates anywhere from you know eight to twelve million Muslims here, you know, in the U.S. Um, but they're not a monolith. From different parts of the world, different cultures, you know, from Indonesia all the way to uh, you know Turkey. So even though the 
the, the faith is the same, but due to cultural uh, influences, the cultural aspects may be a little different. So some families may want to um, tie the chin, you know, as uh, I'm sure anybody who's uh, dealt with, uh, you know, people dying, uh, you know, the, uh, the chin usually droops uh, and then rigor mortis sets in and then, you know, the, the, the body gets stiff. So just traditionally that they, they tie the chin. So in case the rigor mortis does set in, it doesn't leave the mouth open. So that's, that's one of the reasons they tie the chin, sometimes even tie the toes. They usually put the hands on the side, but again, that's cultural. Some from the, the, the Mideast, from you know, Iraq and Syria, they may actually fold the hands in, in the front. Uh, but again, they may um, uh, be with the family to do certain things. Uh, if somebody has like a catheter and stuff, uh, you know, we usually take care of that stuff at the funeral home, uh, but some families may feel uncomfortable to leave that on. Uh, they may wish to, you know, take it out and then wash or, you know, take care of the body. Again, there's the cultural differences, maybe family preferences. Um, that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, but the main thing that I was, we were discussing with Dr. Sami last night, the main thing I would hope that anyone listening to this presentation would take uh, would be the next, uh, the, uh, thing in, in, in our presentation here, speed of burial. Uh, if you just take that, uh, I think that would really help our community. What does that mean, speed? Um, in the sense that, you know, in our culture, uh, you know, there's a saying, that the best way to, to honor the deceased is to bury them towards their final destination. If they are, uh, if they are pious, then, you know, inshallah, they will be in, in comfort in the grave. Again, as the brother was mentioning earlier, that the grave we consider, yes, from the outside looking in, it's just a, a pit in the ground. But in reality, it, in our culture, it may be a garden from the garden of paradise, or maybe a pit from, from hell, uh, depending on how that person has been. Uh, so either way, you know, you rush them towards the final destination. If they've been pious, they would want to be in comfort. If they have not, you know, if they have not so pious, then it's better to remove the ill effects from the earth for the others. So speed, uh, this is something you uh, may not be um, familiar with, because I know some of the, the local, the, the American culture is such that someone passes away, uh, the family is usually there in the hospital room, uh, you know, when someone's taking the last breath or maybe in the, you know, in the home, in the bedroom, but after the funeral, you know, after the body has been moved, then Traditionally here, the family meets and then they decide to maybe go to the funeral home, they make the arrangements and that may take a day or two. And then finally, the day of the funeral, maybe three, four, five, maybe six, seven days, depending on how much time they need to have the, you know, the extended family come in from out of town or to make other arrangements and et cetera. Um, but in our culture, the important thing is the speed of the disposition to get them into the ground as soon as possible, and this, uh, you know, I can testify with, because being a funeral director, um, we have conducted multiple funerals. In fact, we have one, we have two today. In fact, I have to go pick up one. Believe it or not, right after I'm done here, I'm going to pick up one from Resurrection in Talcott, and they should be buried by two o'clock today. So that's I'm just sharing that with you, said that if you, I mean, the staff that is looking after the Muslim patients, if you could expedite the process in any way, that would be a big help to the families. Um, and usually expediting means taking care of the paperwork is just, I know different hospitals have different formalities. And obviously if it's a hospice staff you know, at home, then the nurse that comes in, she has to contact the medical examiner or the coroner to make sure you know, the body has been released. Uh, but these are formalities that sometimes take time. Um, and in certain hospitals, especially the city hospitals, uh, I know they uh, have, uh, they're, they're still going by the old rules. Old rules meaning before 2008, uh, everything, uh, I don't know if, if any of the, the seniors here, uh, if they remember, the death certificates had to be signed in person by the MD. Um, and that's how we traditionally did it. But nowadays, after that, everything is electronic. It's on fax and email. Um, so some of the city hospitals still follow that rule 
that they don't release the body until the death certificate has been signed. So towards that, some of them are, are actually pretty good that they get the death certificate signed very quickly within some hours, if not sometimes minutes after someone dies. Um, but even then, sometimes there is a delay. Uh, and that delay can be a cause of tension for the family. Um, so for example, if someone passes away, uh, you know, in the morning, 7, 8 a.m., uh, it may take some hours between, you know, by the time the formality is filled, especially if there's maybe a change of shift, um, the staff doesn't come in, the doctor is not there, they have to page him or so on and so forth. So if the staff, the chaplain staff or the nurse staff or even the MDs that are signed the death certificate, if they can keep that in mind, that if they can expedite any procedure that needs to be to release that body. Um, because uh, that is usually the first cause of concern. Uh, and just a brief caveat in there, um, sometimes the bodies are being shipped overseas, uh, then they are delayed uh, you know, more because then there's more paperwork involved in, in shipping the bodies overseas. So I would just ask you to keep that in mind. Um, and one uh, offshoot of that is uh, the gift of hope. I don't know if uh, many of you are familiar with uh, this, uh, the group uh, Gift of Hope or Eyesight. Um, these are organ donation groups that are, uh, that's one of the biggest ones here in the Chicagoland area. Um, but one concern that the Muslim community has, and we've brought it up with them directly, and actually they're trying to be pretty accommodating. Uh, but one concern that happens is sometimes um, the body has a hold until the gift of hope releases the body. Meaning that even though the family is ready, uh, the, the, I, I, there's been multiple times where I'm actually at the hospital, the family is calling me, I'm there, we're ready to pick up the body. Then the hospital says, no, we can't release because the gift of hope hasn't given the release. Uh, then, it, it, you know, it, it's a, another long ordeal of trying to call them and they call somebody else, they, this and that. Um, so that's something also to keep in mind. If that is one of the, uh, I know each hospital has a checklist that they go through that before they release the body. So maybe uh, if we can expedite that, maybe start that off earlier, maybe like the gift of hope, they can even be contacted before someone passes away. So if you know someone is ter terminally ill and we know they have a few hours or, or minutes left, uh, then maybe that part of the procedure can be taken care of earlier. We can contact the gift of hope that this family uh, declines. Um, I mean, if they accept, then that's, that's completely okay. Then we wait for them to, um, uh, how can you say, to, you know, to, to finish the service of the body. Uh, but most of the families, here again, that's another uh, question that maybe can be addressed later on, is that, you know, many Muslim families do not do organ donation. Uh, why that is, that can be you know, a question for another day. But just due to that concern, that causes a delay. Um, another, I'll just finish uh, with the, the, in a couple of minutes, is just the medical examiner. Um, most of the counties here, the six county area in the Chicagoland, uh, you know, Lake, Cook, Will, DuPage, uh, McHenry, where did I miss? Uh, Will. Uh, there's six counties here. Uh, Kane, Kane County. Yeah, most of these counties, they're actually pretty nice and they accommodate the Muslims in the sense that sometimes if it's a medical examiner's case, uh, that is some of the sudden death in the ER. Uh, as you know, the ER doctors don't sign the death certificates. So then if someone dies in the ER, then it has to be released by the coroner's office. Um, so we are, we, you know, we have good relationships with all these coroners, but if the nursing staff uh, or the hospice staff, if they can also be in communication with them to somehow expedite their process, then that would also help. Um, fetal demise, I don't know if we have time for that. Mostly this is end of life here, but just simply is that most, uh, even if there is a miscarriage, even if there is a, uh, you know, someone has a, a delivery, uh, would the Muslims uh, usually bury uh, the babies, uh, they're not left over you know, to the hospital. Um, and again, speed is of the essence there too, because the, uh, the fetal death certificate is different than the regular death certificate. And there's longer procedure. I know a lot of one common one is there in Evanston, Evanston North Shore Hospital. 
um, or here like CDH or Northwestern Memorial, um, they are pretty good in filling out the death certificate, but it's just six, it's more detailed death certificate than a regular you know, adult death certificate. Um, and I'll just finish here if you have any questions. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, now we're opening the floor to any questions you might have. Jerry? I don't know if I have a question. I just want to, um, like you said, Kristen, thank you both very much for the presentation. And um, I assume, and I don't take it personally, that the, does anybody remember when there were paper death certificates? I'm probably the only one old enough on this group to remember that. So I, I want to say thank you both for a very informative uh, talk. You're quite welcome, and I and I do remember the the paper death certificates. Um, I'm, I'm turning 40 this year, so don't feel too bad. <laughs> Hi, this is Sandy Moshka. I'm one of the APCs from St. Luke's in Milwaukee. I do have a question on the palliative care side. One of the things we often talk about with our patients and families is prognosis. Is that something that culturally is discussed? Um, if uh, as far as how much time people have and how to um, and what to expect as that trajectory goes towards the end? Um, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. As medical professionals, you have to prepare the families for you know, what, what's, what's coming. Uh, and I would consider it, it, it to trust that they're trusting their family members' health to you. So it would be uh, a breach of trust, I, I would think, not to share with them. So if for whatever, according to the medical you know, prognosis to the four to six months or, and obviously, uh, you know, we, we uh, you know, put that out there with the caveat that obviously no one knows when the time is, but it's, a, it's an educated guess. And I've known people that, you know, that have uh, gone beyond the prognosis for years and some have died earlier, but it's, it is good to prepare them mentally. Otherwise it may be a, a bigger shock if someone just passes away and then they didn't know. Thank you. As a, as a caveat to that, one thing just to sort of remember, um, the spectrum of the Muslim community is, is, is reflective of the spectrum of the American community, right? Very part and parcel. So as you've seen, there are some times where family members want to shield the patient for various reasons from their own prognosis. So sort of getting a feel for that, perhaps talking with the POA and saying, is this something that you want your family member uh, to be aware of how, how much do you want me to disclose? I mean, as a physician, I've, I've, that's usually my first step is I, I head towards the POA and, and have a discussion um, before directly going to the patient, um, particularly if it's an elderly patient that I'm concerned may react um, negatively or um, you know, have a negative outcome if, if they were to be given all of the details of, of the prognosis. But, but absolutely in general, the, the providing that data is, is important. Thank you. In the chat, we have a question from Chaplain Betty Malloy. She asked, one of the challenges with fetal demise is naming the infant or needing to name the infant. What is the Muslim position on naming deceased infants? Uh, uh, so she clarifies, you know, both cultural and religious thoughts on naming. Right, so um, in our tradition, if it's a fetal death, if someone, is born dead, then there's no need to name the child. Um, and then it's simply prepared, depending on how uh, progress it has been during pregnancy. Uh, sometimes we even bury three, four months old, uh, you know, gestation, which is very small. You can even, you know, a few inches long. But even then, we, we, it's, it's part of the, the respect given to the humans, even if it's not a completely formed human, that we still bury them. Um, but sometimes if it's almost full term and then someone passed away, then we would do the proper washing and the shrouding and then bury them there. Um, but if someone is born alive, even if it's preterm, even if they take one breath, that is the criteria. As long as they, they took one breath and they're considered alive. And I think that's the same criteria that's used here legally distinction between the fetal death certificate and the, and the normal death certificate that if it was born alive or not. Um, because in the cause of death, if you see you know, in, in their age, one is, you know, it has years and then it has months 
and even has minutes. And this is for you know for for very small uh, infants that die. Uh, so as long as someone has been born alive, then in that case, then we it is recommended that they do name the child, uh, and because they will have a live death certificate, then they will proper name. Otherwise, if it's a fetal death, then normally in the hospitals the baby is under the mother's name, so then it's baby so and so. Or if the family chooses they want to name the you know the baby, then that's fine also. Uh, but traditionally, there's no need to. But definitely, if the baby is born alive, even if it's premature, then it is given a name. Uh, doctor, this is uh, Chaplain Resident Liddell Briggs. Um, my question has to do uh, not just with death, but I guess preparation. Uh, as a Christian chaplain, uh, by background, uh, I found it most difficult at times to uh, get to a place of trust with a patient who is Muslim, uh, but they're in a position where they're they're dying. There's no Muslim chaplain uh, at uh, Aurora in Luke's or Sinai, but I do, by spirit, want to be present, you know, for them. Um, is there a way for a Christian chaplain to interact with a dying Muslim patient that would respect their, their faith tradition and the fact that uh, I'm the only one there at that moment? You know, you know what I mean? This would be if there's no family member available. It's only that one yeah. Muslim yeah. patient. Yes. I see. Um, ideally, there are some um, rituals or practices that are preferred at the uh, time of death. Um, if uh, and it's basically saying a few things out loud, you know, some prayers, la ilaha illallah, from the surah, the kalima. Uh, but if you cannot, I would say maybe you could even put on maybe a tape or a CD or even something from YouTube. Um, so the, the, the concept here is that in our tradition that we remind them the family, you know, sits close by to, you know, the deceased. I remember, you know, my mother vividly, you know, her last breaths, I was there, I was holding her hand and we would, the whole family, you know, my siblings and my father. Um, so the idea is that people, they go in the state of Iman. Iman meaning that they go testifying to, you know, the... Uh, the, the, the creed that there's none where the worship except Allah, meaning only one God. So the, the, we would hope that their last breath is with that testimony. Um, but obviously, I mean, obviously, if, you, if you, you're a Christian and, and, but you're trying to help and you, you mean well, I would say if you can somehow maybe uh, put some, uh, you know, uh, a tape or, you know, a CD or something, where it has that reminder. So it, it doesn't have to be physically telling them, but as long as there's some literally, you know, it's, it's in the background, uh, then we hope that they, they get the message and hopefully when they leave, they, they would have that, uh, you know, on, on their tongues. Amen, thank you. That, that's quite helpful. I appreciate you much. I suppose I have one last one. Um, I was thinking about the, various cultural rituals that might be present at death and uh, the difficulty in the hospital of having um, so many different team members tending to a patient that communication can get lost along the way. Um, so I'm wondering at what point uh, is it appropriate to start talking with the patient and the family about their preferred rituals so that um, whether it's a chaplain or a palliative care team member can be communicating with other nurses and physicians about what the family might need. Um, one of the things I, I do when, when I, uh, I'm admitting a patient to the hospital um, to discuss advanced directives, for example, I, I do that at the onset. And it's funny, I always start my, my spiel uh, with, um, whether a patient comes in with a hangnail or a heart attack, I have this discussion. I don't want you to be upset um, and I don't want you to be offended. 
and then I'd begin to, to sort of talk about what they would want um, or what their preferences are. If they don't know, I leave it and I ask them, you know, whenever you feel comfortable, when you're, you're feeling better to have that conversation with your family um, and, and to sort of think about it. Um, uh, you know, unsurprisingly, many times it's not brought up by other um, healthcare providers in the past, whether it's their primary care physician, but I think we are getting better. I think there's a better concept now of the spiritual aspects of death and dying uh, within the medical community. Um, but I, I would say, just like anything we do when we take in history uh, uh, from a patient to sort of bring it up at, at the onset, the, the earlier it's brought up, the, the better but sort of gauge um, the, the mental state and the physical state of, of the patient before, before attempting that. Uh, I, I don't know, Mufti Haru, if you had any additional comments to that? No, mashallah, I, I think that's, that's spot on. Uh, I, I would think, yes, bring it on as early as possible because you, you never know. Uh, especially now with COVID, somebody may come in with something very simple, and then before you know, they, you know they're, they're, it's terminal. Uh, they should have that discussion, and if they have not, uh, then they should have that discussion uh, sooner rather than later. I know we're running very short on time, but I want to just say thanks. I appreciate the question, Kristen. I appreciate the responses. I would say um, this conversation we just had over the last couple of minutes is reinforcement what I know we all believe, the value of a highly functioning uh, interdisciplinary team. You know, and, and I agree. I think you're Kristen. Kristen, your question is, you know, it's so often disconnected, and as you said, many different people, and that won't guarantee it, but I think it will ensure that uh, a mutually acceptable outcomes are much more likely with uh, interdisciplinary care teams. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for inviting us uh, and, and for doing your very important. Uh, we're so grateful for this presentation. Thank you. I did want to say thank you very much uh, from my end as well. Um, and also, if there are any questions, um, you have my contact information. You can find me through uh, the a a Advocate Aurora Health um, uh, email list. Um, feel free to reach out if anything pops up afterwards. If I can't answer it, I'll definitely uh, link you to someone that can. But thank you again for inviting us, and, and I look forward to hearing from everyone. Mm. Yeah, the pleasure is all ours, guys. We appreciate it. Have a great weekend, everybody. Well, thank you.